In this lesson, I'm going to introduce the idea of a provability predicate to give us some examples of the kinds of statements that piano arithmetic is incomplete about. So imagine I've got a deductively defined theory. Remember, that's a theory which is defined as the set of consequences of some recursive set of axioms. If T is a deductively defined theory, then this relation is recursive. It's the relation that holds when between x and y when x is the girdle number of a proof in the theory T of the formula with girdle number y. This is a recursive relation because the rules of proof in our logic are recursive. We can test whether or not something counts as a proof and we can test whether or not the undischarged assumptions of our proof are in the set of axioms of the theory T. So if I provide you with a putative proof, uh, you could check in a finite time whether or not this is a proof from the axioms of my theory, and you could check whether the conclusion of your proof is actually the other formula which I gave you. So these are encoded in girdle numbers, we've already had girdle numbers for formulas, and it's very simple to extend the notion of girdle numbering so that each proof is also encoded with a single number. So we're assuming that we've got girdle numbers of proofs and girdle numbers of formulas, and if I've got a deductively defined theory, this relation being a proof of in the theory is recursive. So it follows that if my theory T extends uh, Robinson's arithmetic, then there's some predicate in the theory which can represent this relation. So let P uh, be such a predicate. It's a big, long, complicated arithmetic predicate, but because uh, we can represent all recursive relations, um, this can be done. And then it's going to turn out that in my theory, T is going to prove P of N and M if and only if n is the girdle number of a proof of a formula with girdle number m. So imagine I've got such a predicate p. Consider the formula there is an x such that p holds of x and y. This says that y is the girdle number, number of a formula that has some proof. It says that there is something that is a proof of y in my theory. Now, this is a really interesting thing to be able to express in our language because we've seen already that the class of theorems in my theory cannot be represented by a relation. But this is very, very close to being the class of theorems, because after all, the theorems in my theory are just the things that have proofs. Now, this is not the set of things. We're not representing here the set of things that have proofs. This is the set of things that, according to the theory, have a proof. And there's a subtle difference between those two things. Now, we're going to look at the logical property of logical properties of relations like these. This is an example, this predicate, which is a predicate of y, is an example of what we call a provability predicate. Here is a general definition of a provability predicate for a theory T. So we've got our Gödel numbering for each of our formulas, and a provability predicate in a theory T is a predicate B, which satisfies these three conditions, P1 to P3. First condition, P1, tells us that if T proves A, then T proves B of A. So if A really is something which can be proved from the theory, then the theory also proves that A has a proof. Furthermore, uh, T also proves that if this conditional A implies C has a proof, then if the antecedent A has a proof, then the consequent C has a proof. Finally, uh, the theory proves that if A has a proof, then the claim that A has a proof itself has also has a proof. It's not too difficult to show that in piano arithmetic, uh, the predicate that we chose, there is something which is a proof of Y, is a provability predicate. The reasoning goes like this. If there is some proof of A, then we know that we've got a proof of A, and you could just encode that proof as a girdle number, and then we could in fact show that the thing with that girdle number is a proof of A. 
that's just a recursive relation, and so that's going to be verifiable in the theory T. So, in fact, we could prove that that thing is a proof of A, and so we can prove that there is some proof of A. Uh, P2 is even easier. That says that if we've got a proof of A implies C, and if we've got a proof of A, then we've got a proof of C. And that's very straightforward, because if you have a proof of A implies C, and you have a proof of A, just write those two things next to each other, and then write down C below it, uh, that tree is a proof of uh, C, uh, just using uh, implies elimination. And so P2 is quite straightforward. Uh, P3 is the most complicated one. That's the one which says that if we've got a proof of A, then we can verify that there is a proof of there's a proof of A. And so that requires sort of converting a proof into the means of verifying that this is a Gödel number of a proof. And that's a little bit more complicated, but it's a systematic recursive thing. I'm not going to go through the details of it. You can check it in textbooks. But this should give you an idea of uh, the kinds of properties that need to be checked to verify that something is a provability predicate. What we're going to show is that there are things that you can do with provability predicates, including pinpointing the ways that these theories are incomplete. Here's the main result, which is called Loeb's theorem. Uh, if I have a provability predicate for a theory T, and that predicate is B, and if the diagonalization lemma holds for that theory T, then here's what happens. If T can prove the conditional if A is provable, then A, then T could have proved A all by itself. In other words, if T can prove that conditional, if A is T provable, then A, then it can only do that when T proves A without the antecedent assumption that, T is, uh, that A is T provable. So you might have wondered when we had that list of three principles why uh, this principle wasn't added as an obvious principle that you might expect provability to satisfy. Namely, if something's provable, then it's true. Well, it's for this reason. You can't believe that principle in general, at least if the theory is consistent, at least if there's some things that the theory can't prove. This is inconsistent to add. A theory cannot guarantee that the things that it proves are true. So the theory's got to, in some sense, be open to the idea that its very idea of provability goes beyond what's true. We'll explore some of the, uh, the consequences of that fact soon, but first let's actually verify that this is a fact. Let's prove Loeb's theorem. First, we're going to use the diagonal lemma, which, remember, tells us that every predicate's got a fixed point. Uh, here, the predicate that we're going to use to find a fixed point for is the predicate b of x implies a. So we've got a formula c such that according to the theory, c holds if and only if b of quote c implies a. So intuitively, c has got the same effect as if c has got property b, then a holds. Namely, if c is provable, then a. So let's see what we can do with this. Firstly, t proves the left to right part of the biconditional. T proves if C, then if B of quote C, then A. So by P1, T also proves that that formula is provable. T proves B of if C, then if B of C, then A. Now, P2 tells us that if B holds of a conditional, then if B holds of the antecedent, B holds of the consequent. So in particular, uh, B holds of this conditional here. So by P2, if B holds of the antecedent C, then B holds of this consequent, uh, B of C implies A. Now you can see that the consequent of the conditional itself is B holding of a conditional, which means we can apply P2 again. So this B of a conditional becomes B of an antecedent implies B of a consequent. Now in this conditional, this here is B of B of C. And you'll remember P3 says something about the connection between B of B of something and B of it, namely, if B of something holds, then B of B of that thing holds. So 
in this conditional here, I can replace this antecedent B of B of C by a stronger thing B of C. So we get this. T proves that if B of C, then if B of C, then B of A. Now, logic tells us that B of C implies B of C implies B of A is just equivalent to B of C implies B of A. In general, you know, P implies P implies Q is equivalent to P implies Q. So this theory now gives us B of C implies B of A. So if our theory also told us that B of A implies A, that's the assumption that we're considering or that we actually want to try and refute. If the theory gave us B of A implies A, then the theory would tell us B of C implies A. And now you might say, we've got a problem because this C was chosen so that B of C implies A is equivalent to C. So that would mean that the theory would prove C, which gives by P1 that the theory proves B of C, which means that the theory proves A because we've already got that the theory proves B of C implies A. So what we've seen here, I've got this in blue, is that if the theory tells us B of A implies A, the only way that that could happen is if the theory already proves A. And that's what we were wanting to prove. That's Loeb's theorem. All we used was the existence of a provability predicate and the diagonal lemma. And all of this was just, you know, logic chopping using the principles of a provability predicate and one appeal to the diagonal lemma to set it all up. And we proved that if T gives us that provable things are true, then, well, those things that that holds of have got to be themselves provable. Now, this gives us a very quick proof of Gödel's second incompleteness theorem. The first incompleteness theorem we already proved, which was that, you know, Robinson's arithmetic, piano arithmetic, and any deductively defined extension of these is incomplete. The second incompleteness theorem strengthens this by giving us an example of something that these theories can't prove. Well, now we can give you an example. If I have a provability predicate for a theory T, and the diagonalization lemma holds for T, if the theory is consistent, if it doesn't prove everything, then here's something that the theory cannot prove, that there is no proof of 0 equals 1. That's what this sentence here says, not B of 0 equals 1. It's the theory's way of saying that it's consistent, because the only way the theory could prove that 0 equals 1 is if it proved a contradiction, because it also proves that 0 isn't equal to 1. That's one of the axioms. And so the only way a theory can't prove 0 equals 1 is by being consistent. And so this theory, T, cannot prove its own consistency. Here's why this is true. It immediately follows from Loeb's theorem. Loeb's theorem tells us that if T proves that if there's a proof that of 0 equals 1, then 0 equals 1, then the only way that could happen is if T already proves that 0 equals 1. But T proves that 0 doesn't equal 1. That's one of the axioms of the theory. So T proves that a given formula implies 0 equals 1 if and only if T proves the negation of that formula. To show this from left to right, if I've got a proof of A implies 0 equals 1, I can assume A, derive 0 equals 1. I've also got a proof that 0 doesn't equal 1, so I get a contradiction, and then I can blame it on A to get a proof of not A. On the other hand, if I've got a proof of not A, then it's very easy to prove that if A then 0 equals 1 by assuming A, deriving a contradiction, exploiting the contradiction to get 0 equals 1, and then discharging the assumption of A. So indeed, we've got that if T proves A implies 0 equals 1, that happens if and only if T proves not A. So that's another way of specifying what this part of the conditional is. Now, for the next part of the conditional, 
we know that t proves 0 equals 1 if and only if t is inconsistent as a theory, because it's an arithmetic theory which already proves that 0 doesn't equal 1. So if it proves 0 equals 1, it's got to be inconsistent. On the other hand, if it's inconsistent, it proves everything, including 0 equals 1. So that means that what Loeb's theorem tells us, this instance of Loeb's theorem applied to the formula 0 equals 1, can be reworded as saying that if t proves, well, b of 0 equals 1 implies 0 equals 1, that is just another way of saying not b of 0 equals 1. So t proves that there is no proof of 0 equals 1. That's what the left-hand part of the Loeb's theorem conditional tells us, and the right-hand part tells us that t is inconsistent. So another way of rephrasing Loeb's theorem in this case is that if t can prove this, namely there's no proof of 0 equals 1, then t has to be inconsistent. Contraposing that, that tells us that if t is consistent, then t does not prove this. t does not prove that there's no proof of 0 equals 1. So in the case of piano arithmetic, piano arithmetic, we know it's consistent. It's got a model. It's got a model, the standard model of the integers, sorry, the, the natural numbers. Then we know that piano arithmetic does not prove that there is no piano arithmetic proof of 0 equals 1. That's Gödel's second incompleteness theorem. Now, you might wonder, well, hang on, uh, we know that piano arithmetic doesn't prove that there's no proof of 0 equals 1. Maybe piano arithmetic proves that there is a proof of 0 equals 1, because after all, the theory is only incomplete if it doesn't prove A and doesn't prove not A for some instance of A. Yes, that's true, but of course piano arithmetic doesn't prove that there's a proof of 0 equals 1 because this is a provability predicate which describes the actual proofs in piano arithmetic, and at least in the standard model, there is no proof that 0 equals 1, because there is no proof that 0 equals 1, because all the things that piano arithmetic proves are true in the standard model. So this is an example of something that PA is incomplete about. It doesn't prove that there's no proof of 0 equals 1. It doesn't prove that there is a proof of 0 equals 1. It cannot tell. Now, of course, you and I know that there is no piano arithmetic proof of 0 equals 1. So the claim that there is no proof is something that's true. So why don't we just add it to PA as a new axiom? After all, it's true. And if PA leaves it out, we should be able to do have a more complete picture of what's true if we add it in as an axiom. And you'd be right if you said that. So let's do that. Let's add that as a new axiom. Now, a neat thing about that is if we add that as a new thing to prove things from, we can now prove that there's no proof that 0 equals 1. And this has got to be consistent because it's true in the standard model. All the PA axioms are true in the standard model, and there is no proof in PA that 0 equals 1. So the standard model is going to tell us not B of 0 equals 1. So this is consi a consistent theory. And it extends piano arithmetic. The diagonal lemma still holds. So the Loeb's theorem proof that we had before still applies to this. So in fact, this new theory should also not be able to prove that there's no proof of 0 equals 1. Isn't that inconsistent? I'll let you think about that for a bit. But no, it isn't inconsistent because that's not what this says. This here, where I said there's no proof of 0 equals 1, that is something that follows from these axioms. But let me be a little bit more explicit and write it out a bit more. What it says is PA together with the assumption that there is no PA proof of 0 equals 1 can indeed prove that there's no PA proof of 0 equals 1. That's all correct. Of course it can prove that, because that's one of the axioms. So it's just a one-line proof. What it can't prove is now, now there's more proofs, because we've got an extra axiom. Uh, there's no PA proof of 0 equals 1. And now there's this other thing that it can't prove. Namely, we can't prove that there's no proof in this new extended system, where we not only have all of PA, but this extra axiom. Now we've got no assurance that that thing can't prove 
that zero equals one, at least according to this theory itself. Now, writing out all this, you know, this big subscript here and saying, you know, there's no proof in this system and maybe there's a proof in this system, that all gets a little bit complicated. There's a, a smoother notation for this. Let's abbreviate theory T says there's no proof of zero equals one as, this, as the claim that theory T is consistent. So, because after all, that's what it means. If, if a theory is consistent, it doesn't prove that zero equals one, at least for an arithmetic theory. And uh, if the theory does prove that zero equals one, then it's inconsistent. If it doesn't prove that zero equals one, then it's consistent. So this is a, a plausible way of re rendering that. No proof of zero equals one in the theory means the theory is consistent. So what we've got is that PA doesn't prove that PA is consistent. PA plus con PA does prove that PA is consistent, but PA plus con PA as a theory of its own does not prove that that whole theory is consistent. So then you might think, well, why not add another axiom to our theory? And you could. In general, for any consistent deductively defined theory T that extends PA, that theory does not prove its own consistency. The claim that this theory is consistent goes beyond what the theory itself can prove. And this is, this is really, really interesting because there's a sense in which a theory is sort of committed to its own consistency in the weak sense that if you use the theory, you're presumably in some sense assuming that the theory is true. But that is something which goes beyond what you can prove from the theory itself. So it turns out we've got this hierarchy of theories of arithmetic. You've got piano arithmetic here, then you've got this stronger theory which says the piano arithmetic together with its own consistency claim, then piano arithmetic together with piano arithmetic's consistency claim together with the consistency claim of this one. And that's even stronger. And you can keep on going forever and ever and ever and ever uh, for any finite number of steps. In fact, you could look back on all of those finite number of steps and say all of those are consistent. And that would itself be an extra theory, which you could then look at and say, well, that's consistent. And that would be a stronger theory. You've got this truly unbounded hierarchy of theories. None of these theories are complete. As long as you've got a deductively defined theory, which is consistent, extending piano arithmetic, it's always not going to prove its own consistency statement. There's no single best, strongest, deductively defined arithmetical theory which encompasses all of the others. What we've got here is a, a properly unbounded collection of theories. So, this tells us something about logic's power and logic's limits, and this is where I want to end uh, this lesson. The techniques of logic are powerful enough to analyze lots of different forms of reasoning, lots of different forms of proving, lots of different forms of constructing models. There's lots of ways of constructing proofs and models and the interrelationship between them. These techniques are so powerful that we're able to use them to chart the limits of those techniques themselves. They've got enough descriptive power to be turned back on themselves so that we can see what we can do with those very techniques. And in doing that, we've seen limits on expressibility. We've seen there are some things that you can express in the language of predicate logic, and there's other things like the concept of infinity, uh, the concepts of a, a bounded sequence, all of those sorts of things we've shown are, in a strict sense, inexpressible in the language of first order predicate logic. We've shown the limits on definability. We've seen various sets of uh, numbers or sets of uh, properties of, of sentences that cannot be defined in the sense of having some sentence which we can prove true of the things which are in the set and prove false of the things which aren't in the set. We've also seen limits on decidability. We've seen that there are theories that get grow so complex that they burst beyond the bounds of being decidable into being properly undecidable in the sense that their set of theorems is not recursive. And we've seen limits on completeness. We've seen that any deductively defined theories which extend Robinson's arithmetic are going to be essentially incomplete. 
So each of these things are limits on what we are able to do. But the field that is bound by these limits is nonetheless, in another sense, wide open because there is plenty of room for us to create and explore without end.